Hello and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar, Steeped the Chemistry of Tea. I'm Natalie Starkey from Chemistry World and I'm here with you for the next hour where we'll be joined by author and chemist Michelle Frankel to hear all about her, how chemistry can help us brew the perfect cup of tea. Now, as you may know, tea is a very popular drink all around the world with billions of cups being drunk every single day. However you take your tea, you might not realise that it contains hundreds of different chemical compounds which contribute to its colour, taste and scent and its stimulating effects. The best known of those is obviously caffeine, probably the reason many of us drink it. But why does a plant make caffeine in the first place and what other mood altering substances are found in a cup of tea? We're going to learn about this and much more over the next hour when Michelle starts her presentation. But before I welcome Michelle on screen, I'd just like to add that this webinar is being recorded. So if you miss anything or just want to re-watch the webinar or share it with friends, then look out in your inbox in the coming days for a link to the recording. So let's welcome Michelle on screen now. She's joined us. Hello, Michelle. Welcome. Hi, I'm excited to be here. Oh, we are so happy to have you. Um, I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about you um, and then, then we'll soon move on to your presentation. So Michelle Frankel is the Frank B. Mallory Professor of Chemistry at Bryn Mawr College in the US, where she teaches and does research on molecules with weird and unexpected shapes. She's also an adjunct scholar at the Vatican Observatory and was elected a fellow of the American Chemical Society in 2009. Her essays on science, culture and policy have appeared in Slate, the journal Nature Chemistry and in several print collections. And she's written an article in this month's uh, Chemistry World magazine, which you can have a look at. It's also on our website. Now, uh, Michelle, you must have been thrilled and perhaps a little shocked to see some of the response to the release of your book last month. I just wanted to highlight the brilliant exchange on X, formerly Twitter, of course, um, between the US Embassy in London and the Cabinet Office, um, which is also in, in the UK. Um, were you shocked at the diplomatic row you caused when you uh, suggested that you should add salt to tea? I was completely and totally bowled over. Um, I you know, expected people to perhaps be a bit interested in a book about tea in Britain, but I certainly did not expect the US Embassy to wade in. It was brilliant, wasn't it? I can't imagine any better, um, you know, marketing for your for your book. It's just been brilliant. Um, and it was so lovely to see people getting really involved in the spirit of it. Um, and, you know, I think it actually probably has got people more interested in what they're drinking. Um, but, you know, it, I am interested to know about microwaving tea um, because as a Brit, obviously, that does bother me greatly. I, I would never think of doing such a thing. <laughs> but yeah, the salt, again, that's an interesting one. Um, now, as you can probably guess, I'm a regular tea drinker and I'm very excited to hear more about your book. Um, I just want to say to the audience that you can buy the book still. It actually came out a few weeks ago um, and RSC Books have kindly shared a discount code for us. Um, so it's on screen now. You can use the code chemist 30 for 30% 30 off the print or digital book at the RSC book page. Now, the offer runs from today until the end of February 2024 and we've got a link on screen and we'll share that in the chat and um, any problems with that code do let us know at the chemistry world webinars inbox and we'll be able to help you out obviously we haven't tried it yet today and it's just started so we'll hopefully that should all work for you but do let us know if there's any problems now a really great thing about chemistry world webinars is that they're interactive which means the audience can ask questions about any aspect of what Michelle covers today um, and we always love to hear from our audience so <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you want to send any questions, please use the questions box, which you'll find somewhere on your screen on GoToWebinar. It, I won't try and describe where it is because it does depend what kind of um, platform you've joined us from, whether it's a phone or a tablet or a, a PC. So find that questions box and we already have some people who have done so and popped in some questions. You probably won't be able to see other people's questions, but I can see all of them and I'll be able to put those to Michelle at the end of the webinar. So keep sending them in. Um, and we've actually already had some questions sent in in advance. So people are very excited to, to hear hear um, what Michelle's got to say. So um, without further ado, let's grab our cups of tea and I'm going to hand over to Michelle to get started. I will be back in a little bit. We've got some polls, some questions to ask our audience as we go along. So I'll, I'll be back in a bit, but Michelle, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks so much. Well, I want to particularly thank Chemistry World for the chance to talk today. It's fun to be able to reach out across uh, the Atlantic and talk about the beverage that we all love so much, um, the world's most popular beverage after water tea. 
So the story for me really starts um, in 1885. And I spent a period of time at the Othmer Library, which is part of the Science History Institute in Philadelphia. And um, I was reading through the chemical news, 10 years of the chemical news. And I happened on this paper on the infusion of tea by Wilhelmina Green. And I thought, one, this is a woman chemist in 1885, and it's my favorite beverage. And she talks about how remarkable it is, how little was known respecting the composition of tea infusion as drunk. There was a lot about the leaf, but not very much about the infusion. And I stashed the paper, I enjoyed reading it, tried to figure out who Wilhelmina Green was, could not track her down. If anyone knows who Wilhelmina Green is, I'd love to know. So from there, we moved to 1976 and I was a first year chemistry student at UC Irvine. And my chemistry professor was Sherry Rowland who would eventually win the Nobel Prize for the destruction of ozone in the, or for figuring out the mechanism of the destruction of ozone um, in the stratosphere. But the midterm exam asked a question, the color of tea lightens perceptibly when lemon is added, why? Um, and I had a complete and total panic. Um, I was hoping you know, for a lot of quantitative questions on this exam, but I stopped for a minute, realized I could figure it out, and for the first time felt like a chemist. Um, so tea can be a pretty potent brew when it comes to chemistry. Fast forward to 2020, it's um, break, my grading is done, um, and Andre Chemist posts this question on Twitter, um, now X, is there an extractive advantage to the tetrahedral tea bag over the traditionally shaped tea bag? Or does it just look cooler? Well, for chemists, there's a completely obvious answer. Of course, tetrahedra are cooler. Um, but in fact, um, I wondered, do we know? What do chemists know about tea bags, the shape of tea bags? What do we know about tea overall? Um, and because it was between semesters and because I was looking for something to write for Nature Chem, I started digging into the chemistry literature around tea. Um, and it turns out there is an enormous literature on tea, um, on the tea leaf, on the tea infusion, um, on how you produce tea. And I spent a couple of days wandering around in it and produced this essay, A Chemist's Cup of Tea. And shortly thereafter, the pandemic broke. And um, Helen Arms at the Royal Society of Chemistry Books wondered, after reading the essay, if I could turn it into a book, which was a really good question. And as it turns out, I could. So here's the book that resulted, um, Steep the Chemistry of Tea. And I'm gonna sort of provide a taste of each of the chapters in the book as we go through this webinar. So to start with, this book is about Camellia sinensis. Um, it's about a particular plant and there's lots of herbal teas and lots of other types of infusions that you can make from plants. But this, I'm gonna focus just specifically on the infusions made from this particular plant. And of course, this is a book about chemistry and it's a book not necessarily for chemists. So it needs to start with a little bit of chemistry background for those for whom chemistry is not their field. So the big challenge for me was figuring out how to make a book that worked for non-chemists, but that also was fun and interesting for chemists. And so my strategy was to take four big ideas of chemistry, four things that chemists often use to explain what's happening with molecules and atoms, and frame the book around that. All matter is made up of atoms, opposites attract, things have to get close, and of course the key is that molecular shape is what controls molecular function and molecular properties. So these themes resound throughout the book. But if you're a chemist, these are of course things that are, you know, they're your bread and butter, so what makes it fun for chemists? There's a bunch of asides, a bunch of caveats, and some references if you want to track down the primary literature. Um, not everyone wants to read that whole chapter on chemistry. And so for me, one of the most fun things to do was to figure out how to put together three paragraphs that would tell you everything you really needed to know to read the book. Um, you might want to go back and look at things afterwards, but this is all of chemistry in three paragraphs. Um, and don't tell my students um, who take you know, two semesters of this from me, um, but really I think you can sum it all up in this short section. 
So I'm going to start with how do you get from the tea plant to the tea leaves that show up in your cup? Um, the one single plant gives rise to an enormous number of styles of tea. And when tea was first being imported into Britain, um, people thought that green tea and black tea came from two different plants. But in fact, they all come from a single plant. And there's a number of different teas shown in this um, slide here, matcha green tea, white teas, um, teas that are rolled into balls with flowers, teas with roasted rice, bancha from, um, here's some bancha from uh, Japan. So you can get an enormous number of styles of tea from just a single plant. So let's take a poll. I'd like to know what do people drink for tea? Right, we'll just get the poll up on the screen. There we go, there it is. Um, so if you drink it, what is your favorite style of tea? I, I've i added if, if you drink it, because I realize we may have some people on the call who um, don't drink tea, which you know is, is fine. We'll accept you all here today. Um, even if you know you prefer coffee, you crazy people. Um, so we've got a few options here. We've got black tea, which is definitely my favorite, green tea, uh, and it's pronounced pu'er, pu'er tea, is that correct, yep. Michelle? We were having this discussion earlier. Yes, yep. And oolong tea or something else. Um, so yes, there might be another type of tea that we haven't mentioned here. You can click on the screen and pop your answer in there. This is just for a bit of fun. Um, you don't have to take part. Um, and we'll have a little look at the results in a minute. I can see already that um, the results aren't surprising me. I can see what people are clicking on already. We have a very popular result here. I have to say that I drink almost exclusively black tea. Um, in the mornings, I tend to drink uh, a caffeinated um, black tea in, in a tea bag. And in the afternoons, I might switch to a decaf tea because I'm quite um, kind of sensitive to caffeine. Um, but uh, yeah, and in the evening, I might go for something like a chamomile tea. So a kind of a herbal thing in the evening. So but black tea would definitely be my my answer. Right. I think we'll bring up the results so we can all have a look what everyone thought. There we go. 56% of the audience thought um, that black tea was their, their favourite style of tea. Um, and then we had 22% of green tea um, and oolong was seven, pu'e was 2% and other was 13. Um, if you want to pop in the chat your others, I, I'm intrigued to know, um, we, we'll come back to that when we go to the next poll, but I'm intrigued to know what your other types of tea might be. You can use the questions box for that if you want to put the answers in there. Um, but I'll hand back over to Michelle now to continue um, and do keep sending in your questions as well I'll just add we've got some questions coming in already Michelle it's very busy in, in the chat box today oh, I'll hand great. Back over now. <laughs> okay so it does surprise me a little bit so you're broader drinkers of tea than the general populace is um, about 75 percent of tea that's drunk is black tea and only about two percent is oolong um, and sort of 20 25 percent is green tea um, so in fact, um, you're a pretty broad group of tea drinkers. And one thing I learned in writing the book is it encouraged me to try teas that I hadn't tried in a long time or had never tried before. So here is a flowchart showing what happens from the picking of fresh tea leaves to the making of six different styles of tea. So there's black tea, white tea, oolong tea, green tea, pu'er tea, and yellow teas. Um, Black tea is what most people drink. White tea is pretty rare, um, and it's extraordinarily expensive in most, um, in most cases. It begins with picking the leaves, um, and then from there, there's a number of steps. Tea is a highly processed food, um, and we tend to think of processed foods as a bad thing, um, but one of the early writers about tea refers to tea requiring the hand of a master, it's an art, to bring out um, the various compounds um, that give tea its taste and aroma. I'm also going to say that the making of tea leverages trauma for flavor. And that's what I want to focus on here is this bruising and enzymatic oxidation step, which happens early on. And, um, and you can get it either fully oxidized, which gives you black tea, which is what most of us drink. Um, oolong tea is a partial oxidation. Um, there are steps that follow, and not every tea goes through every step. And I'd like to point out that pu'er tea um, is interesting because it uses a fermentation step that relies on a mold. Um, so like uh, many cheeses that rely on molds for their flavor development, um, tea can also rely on that. So what happens um, when we think about um, leveraging this trauma? 
So there are catechins, um, tannins um, that are in the tea. In this case, I've shown epigallocatechin. Um, and I've shown a bruised banana from my lunch. And it turns out that polyphenol oxidases, um, so the epigallocatechin is a polyphenol, um, oxidize the um, polyphenols to other compounds. And in this case, theorubigin, which is one of the compounds that gives tea um, its bitter and astringent flavor, but it's also one of the compounds that gives rise to the beautiful ruby red color that you get in a black tea. It's the same type of enzyme that produces the bruising in apples and bananas. It's a response to trauma and it's a way to sort of capture the oxygen before it can go on and damage the rest of the cellular mechanisms. Um, so in this case, you know, bruised bananas I might not want to eat, but my bruised tea, ah, that's fabulous. There are other processes that go on besides the oxidation using the polyphenol oxidases. And tea contains beta carotene and um, neoxanthin and other pigments that eventually get converted to these beautiful smelling compounds, beta ionone, which is the scent of violets, um, damascenone, which is part of the scent of roses, um, also in whiskey, as well as in tea. Um, so these oxidative processes are what give rise to both color and aroma in tea. All right, it's early in the morning um, in Bryn Mawr, and um, what many of us are interested in when we drink tea is the caffeine, the drug in the cup. Um, it's interesting to see where caffeine comes from in the plant. Um, it's, for the plant, doesn't make it to keep people awake. The plant makes it as a pesticide and an herbicide. So um, if you're drinking tea, you might be drinking a, you know, extraction of this pesticide herbicide. It's made from the residues um, that make up DNA and RNA. So essentially it's a recycle reuse for the plant. Um, it uses pieces that are broken off from DNA to turn it into eventually theobromine and caffeine. The gene has been identified for this. It's not yet been silenced. So people have not been able to make a naturally decaffeinated tea by genetic modification, um, but it has been inserted into other plants to act as a natural pesticide in both tobacco and into some chrysanthemum plants. Um, caffeine works by binding to adenosine receptors, um, and here is a structure of one of the receptors. There are a number of different receptors that bind adenosine. Um, they also, for the most part, all bind caffeine, um, and you can see the caffeine tucked into the pocket up here. Um, this is a transmembrane protein, um, and when it binds um, its targets, it essentially flicks the little tail at the bottom. It's a, a almost physical switch that kicks off a cascade of processes inside the cell. It's got a little pincers at the top, and caffeine molecules slide in with the six-membered ring at the bottom of the pocket. So you can see the six-membered ring kind of sticking in the bottom of the pocket. Understanding the binding, lets us design things that might bind better. So people have been designing super caffeines. Um, and one of these molecules is shown here, um, PSB36. It has the same xanthine core as caffeine has, um, but also includes a long tail. It's actually got two long tails, but the long tail in the box is the one that inserts itself deeply into the binding pocket and that it helps it bind more tightly. It binds more tightly by a factor of 10 than caffeine. And interestingly, the research into these compounds is fueled by the ability of caffeine to cross the blood-brain barrier um, and its potential of these analogs to act as drugs, for example, for Parkinson's disease. So what happens when you get things in the cup besides caffeine? And there are things in the cup that we would like besides caffeine. There are hundreds of compounds in tea. And here is a short list of things that are in there, and I'll talk briefly through some of them and then give a couple of examples. So catechins, tannins, um, are one of the primary components. There's about 200 milligrams of catechins in a cup of tea. There's caffeine on the order of um, about 100 milligrams, plus or minus, depending on the kind of tea um, and how long you've steeped it and the temperature at which you steeped it, but you're getting 100 milligrams or less of caffeine in a cup of tea. 
There's L-theanine, um, which is an amino acid. It's found in a very few plants. Tea is one of the few plants it's found in. And interestingly, that tends to moderate the effects of caffeine, um, decrease the jitters. Um, some people refer to this as the sort of zen molecule that's in, that's in tea. There are theoflavins, theorubigans, and theobrownins. These are flavor and aroma compounds that you find in the tea. They're all produced by um, oxidation of the catechins. There are a bunch of alkaloids besides caffeine sitting in the tea, um, including theobromine, um, which is found in chocolate um, and also has a bit of a stimulating effect. There are metals and inorganic compounds in your tea. Um, fluoride, tea is actually a dietary source of fluoride. It's one of the few plants that uptakes um, fluoride in an inorganic form, but the only other um, organism that's known to do this is a sea sponge that kind of grows off the coast of New Zealand. Um, so it's kind of interesting um, to see fluoride in there. Fluoride uptakes with aluminum. There's a lot of aluminum as aluminum plus three in tea. There's iron, there's a dash of uranium. Um, and someone's evaluated um, what the uranium uptake is and some of the other radioactive compounds. Um, they conclude there's no risk, not surprising. There are organic acids in there, including oxalic acid, which is found in rhubarb. Um, I'm gonna say my mother told us not to eat the, rub the rhubarb leaves because they contained oxalic acid, which was toxic. Um, it turns out my mother was not right. Um, there's not enough really oxalic acid in rhubarb leaves or in tea to provide, um, to be toxic. And there's insect DNA. These are natural products. Um, no one is picking off all the insects. Some of them are quite tiny. Um, people have identified the DNA of up to 400 um, different insects in samples of commercial tea. So it's just a little, you know, added taste of, taste of the natural world. Um, so could you in fact mock up a cup of tea? If you follow Star Trek, um, if you follow Jean-Luc Picard, he would say to the air, tea, Earl Grey, hot. Um, and the replicator would produce a cup of tea. And the question is, could we mock up a cup of tea? And in doing so, understand um, what it is that primarily gives rise to the taste and to the aroma. So a group took 51 compounds in concentrations that mimicked the concentrations in an infusion of tea, in particular, a Darjeeling tea. Um, they produced um, one gram of, um, the tea mimics one gram in 200 milliliters. And they used both sensory experiments and trained testers to assess the taste of this mocked up tea. And they used a couple of different sensory tests, including the half tongue test, which involves putting um, a compound on one side of your tongue, um, plain water on the other side of your tongue, and sticking your tongue in and out of your mouth rapidly for 30 seconds. I will admit this is something I have never tried, um, but it's a way to assess astringency in uh, compounds. They also involve nose clamps. Um, these people were serious about tasting their tea is perhaps what I'm trying to say. It, they took the 51 compounds, and in fact, the trained tasters found that it very uh, adequately reproduce the taste and aroma of the tea. So they wondered if they could reduce it down further. And they got a list of about a dozen compounds. Nine of them are these top compounds. These are the flavanol glycosides. They produce like a drying, velvety-like astringency on the tongue. Um, the two catechins, um, particularly epigallocatechin gallate, um, provide another kind of puckery astringent uh, taste. And then caffeine gives you the bitterness. There's a couple of interesting things in here. So for example, um, neither the theoflavins nor GABA um, added anything to the taste. Um, GABA is gamma aminobutyric acid, um, another compound thought to um, be part of the calming effects of tea. Um, they don't add anything to the taste and neither um, did particularly um, the, uh, L-theanine, um, which had been thought to add perhaps a bit of umami taste. Um, I spiked my tea with extra L-theanine to see if you could taste it if you went beyond what's usually in tea. And if you do, it gives kind of a sweet aftertaste to the tea. So let's try another poll if we can. 
Brilliant. Let's bring that poll up. Oh, that was quick. Um, okay, this is a good one. What's your go-to way to make tea? Um, and I know people can be very specific about this. I'm super lazy, so I literally put my tea bag in the mug and I don't even have a kettle. I've got an instant hot water tap and so everything's very quick um, and I don't even steep my tea for very long. I just kind of give it a bit of a swish in the mug and add some um, some oat milk in fact that's my favorite so that that would be my option but you might like loose tea um it, the tea leaves and in an infuser in a mug or in a teapot um and i i don't know if i can even say this but some of you might pop a tea bag in a mug and microwave it um and i can see that actually looking at the results coming in some people do do that um which i'm really intrigued about i've never even tried it i just can't bring myself to do it um and again there's other options of course so do let us know in the chat um what those other options might be. Um, we've got, um, I was just going to go for the, the other options for the previous poll in terms of the what other types of tea. Um, we've just got a lot of people saying white tea. So they, they really like white tea, which is um, which is an interesting one. I, I have tried it before. I didn't like it very much. Um, I don't know why. What, what's different about white tea? Um, so white tea has um, a little bit less of some of the oxidized compounds in it, so can be milder and less bitter. Um, but some people really like the bitter bite of tea. I do. Um, yeah. So white white tea is less of a favorite for me as well. Mm. And you wouldn't probably add milk to it, would you? I expect. So. No, you wouldn't add milk yeah. or sugar. Um, really, the sort of milk and sugar is kind of what you add to black tea, and I wonder if that's because that is generally the bitterest of the teas. Yeah. Yeah, it sweetens it up as well. Okay, let's share those results on screen. The top result was a tea bag and a mug. Thank you, all those people that are like me. Um, I don't know if we're lazy or we just need to get that tea as quickly as possible. So that's 56% of people. Um, and then it was loose tea leaves and a teapot at 22%. Um, and then and then we had um, just one percent of people using the mug in the microwave um so that's that's kind of good to hear but i'm glad you're doing it and i, I hope you're getting good results um doing that and others i've probably got some some other options coming in in the chat soon but i'll hand back to you michelle um yeah unsurprising tea bags are really convenient um and an easy way to make tea although i'm going to say and i'm going to argue a little bit that an infuser and a mug is almost as easy and produces really much better results so let's talk about the agony of the leaves, which is a way of talking about what happens when um, the water hits the leaves. They tend to writhe and unfurl, um, hence the name, the agony of the leaves. They look like they're being tormented. Um, so the first thing to know, and um, Wilhelmina Green knew this in 1885, um, but subsequent work has um, shown the same thing, which is the first thing that really comes out is the caffeine. And at 100 degrees um, C, at the boiling point of water, you get almost 100% of the caffeine in the leaves extracted in five minutes. Um, and that's what Wilhelmina Green showed. The tannins, um, the polyphenols, come out more slowly. Um, so one of my um, cousins wondered, she has like 30 seconds to make her tea in the morning. She's a single mom. And she wondered, was she getting enough caffeine? And I told her, you know, you might not be getting the best tasting cup of tea. You're missing some of those beautiful aromatic compounds, but you're getting the caffeine. And she said, that's really all I want is that caffeine. Um, the temperature really matters. Um, and I'm going to repeat this later in the talk. Pre-warm the pot or the cup. Um, you could do this if you're a chemist in a constant temperature bath and keep things nice and warm, but you want to keep it over 90 degrees Celsius if you're extracting black tea. Um, the amount of caffeine um, extracted, if you can, in a minute, you're getting about half the caffeine. This is done using a tea bag. Um, at five minutes, you've gotten virtually all of the caffeine removed. Here is a warning. At 60 degrees, the total caffeine extracted is roughly half that from 90 degrees. Um, and at 70 degrees, um, the extraction is slowed by a factor of two. So if your tea is not hot enough, the water you're using to make your tea is not hot enough, you are not getting the caffeine dose you think you're getting. Um, at conferences in the US, the water is often around 70, 80 degrees, um, and so you're depriving everyone of their caffeine dose. Um, beware. Um, so microwaving tea. Um, the US Embassy press release, I love the last line, we will continue to make tea in the proper way by microwaving it. And I will say a lot of people in the US do in fact put a tea bag in water 
um, and stuff it in the microwave and zap it up. Um, what you can get, however, is that kind of cloudiness. So that's not uh, foam on a latte in the picture, but that's a cup of tea um, that I made in the microwave um, so I could see the effect. Um, the water is pretty hard at the college, lots of ions in the water, and that promotes the development of what's called tea scum. It's a kind of floating raft of organics, calciums, uh, calcium and magnesium carbonates. Um, and it happens when you microwave tea because you bring things to the boiling point so quickly, you do not remove the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. So you have more carbonates in the water um, and oxygen also promotes the development of the organics that lead to this raft of floating stuff. Um, and so microwaving your tea turns out to really be a bad idea. Um, you really want to boil it to get some of that oxygen out and to get the carbon dioxide out. You can use deionized water, um, and that will help reduce the formation of the scum on the top, which you can even get if you don't microwave your tea. Um, but I will say that the Brits are right. You should definitely not microwave your tea. Use that kettle or your hot tap. Adding stuff to tea. Um, so my husband is a fan of Earl Grey tea. I'm gonna say I'm not a fan of Earl Grey tea, but one of the things that's in Earl Grey tea um, is linalool. Um, and in fact, the uh, citrus fruit that's used, the oil from the citrus fruit that's used to make Earl Grey tea to give it that wonderful scent um, was perhaps originally a strategy to enhance the aroma of poor quality tea. Um, so linalool is in tea of all sorts and linalool then could be enhanced by adding the um, orange oil to the, to the tea. It turns out that linalool activates the same pain relief pathways as opioids. You can actually block it using an opioid antagonist. Um, and inhalation of the aroma has been shown to reduce pain perception in mice and anxiety in humans. Um, so in fact, you know, that Earl Grey tea with that very characteristic scent um, is something that can reduce anxiety in humans. So when my husband has that cup of tea before his departmental meeting, he's on to something. Although it's not been enough to encourage me to drink Earl Grey tea, I'm gonna say. I'll just add that um, caffeine is also something that can enhance the efficacy of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so aspirin, um, uh, ibuprofen, things like that. Um, so in fact, pain relief and tea um, go together. All right, the big question, milk or tea first? The question of milk or tea first really only arises if you're um, pouring from a pot. If you're making it directly in a mug, the milk goes last. Um, the milk goes last because otherwise you cool things down too much for effective steeping, um, particularly that extraction of caffeine. So what I have shown up here on the slide is the British standard for the preparation of tea. The British standard was put together um, not actually for the making of tea to drink um, as kind of a social drink or to drink with um, a biscuit or um, for the afternoon, but was for sensory um, determination. So people looking at quality of tea and assessing the qualities of tea. Um, they suggest really you should try it without milk, but if you are using milk, um, they come just down on the side of adding it first. Um, they warn about the temperature differential. And when the tea book first came out, there was a lot of fuss because I said, you should use warm milk in your tea, by which I did not actually mean heating the milk up but um, really cold milk from the fridge dumped into hot tea can in fact curdle. Um, but for me, one of the really interesting things was finding more women scientists in the history of tea. Um, so some people can tell the difference whether you've added the tea first or the milk first. And um, biochemist Muriel Bristol, who's shown in the picture here, um, was having tea with the statistician uh, Ronald Fisher. And she asserted she could tell the difference. And her companions thought that she could not. And they thought they should put her to the test. Could she in fact tell the difference? The answer was yes, she could. But it led Fisher to develop the null hypothesis. Um, so tea really plays um, a role in this arguably 
pretty important statistical tool. Um, so I love the fact that there are both these women scientists involved in the history of tea, but also the way in which it spins out into other fields. So the last thing I would like to talk about is um, the technology with tea. So for example, the initial question that kicked off both the essay and the book, um, the shape of the tea bag, does it matter? And the unequivocal answer is that really the shape does not matter, though the tea bag material and the tea bag size do. Um, you're going to get more caffeine and more antioxidants, more of these flavor compounds, more of these beautifully scented compounds if you forgo a bag and use loose tea. Um, and forget those machines um, with the little pods in them. Um, they are convenient, but they're not really producing as aromatic a cup of tea as you could get. Um, but really what matters is the size, and it, tea requires a lot of space to expand. If it doesn't expand enough, um, the water doesn't get good access to the tea leaves, and again, you extract less of those beautiful scented compounds. So here's a whole collection of tea infusers. Um, and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. They can be um, quite cute, you know, the little yellow submarine and the owl. They can be pretty workaday, like the um, ones in the lower, uh, lower um, row. My favorite is the one on the left-hand side. That just it's a, a very convenient one. It's roughly the size of my mug, and you want them large because otherwise you will not be able to make enough tea. Um, so I took a bunch of infusers, I measured their interior volumes, um, predicted how much dry tea you could use. Tea expands by a factor of four or five um, and figured out just how much tea you could prepare given that size infuser. Um, and I used the method um, that one of my colleagues at the Vatican Observatory uses to measure the volume of meteorites. Um, you don't want to put meteorites in water to determine their volume by displacement. These are one-of-a-kind um, samples. And of course, I can't determine the um, size of the interior of a tea basket um, by pouring water in it because the water goes right through. Um, so Guy Consolmagno used um, small glass beads um, to determine the volume of things. And that's the same, uh, same method that I used here. Um, there's a little bit of irony involved in that. Um, Guy got the idea by looking at the sugar that was stirred into coffee in Italy, which is a fairly um, large grain sugar, and that's what gave him the idea to use the glass beads. Um, so coffee plays a role in, um, in tea drinking as well. Um, you can see that the cute little yellow submarine, um, you can put about five milliliters of dry tea in, and you can't even make a good mug full from, from that. Also point out those smaller ones um, tend to have fewer holes, and so again, you're not getting good contact with the solvent. But if you use a big basket and put loose tea in, you've got a lot of space to, um, to get the tea in contact. The other advice I would have is agitate your tea bag. Um, choose your teapot wisely. So you want to consider the shape. Um, the composition and ways to keep the teapots warm. Um, so here's an assortment of teapots from my shelf. Um, I'll point out that the one at the top right um, has a built-in tea cozy. It's a felt-lined stainless steel top, and that works fabulously to keep the tea warm. The best of the teapots is the one at the lower left, which is actually a coffee pot. It's double-walled glass. Um, it keeps the tea at a great temperature for steeping, but also um, keeps it warm for drinking for a significant period of time. I have two Tetsu Kiyusu um, at the top left and bottom right, um, which are from Japan. The one at the bottom right is sort of the perfect shape for a teapot. It's spherical um, and it gives you the least amount of surface area for the interior volume. The only trouble with these is they're made from iron, and given the heat capacity of iron, when you pour hot water into them, um, unless you have pre-warmed them, um, you will definitely get the water cooled down below the temperature at which you get effective steeping. So even though I love the look and feel of those pots, they're not my um, top choices for making uh, a pot of tea. I will say it again, 
pre-warm your pot, pre-warm your mug, um, you'll get a tastier cup of tea out at the end. So all together, what's a perfect cup of tea? Um, I'm going to say that the perfect cup of tea is what you enjoy. Um, but knowing the chemistry can allow you to tweak it to get what you really want. So if caffeine is what you're going for, make sure to brew these things at a high temperature. If antioxidants is what you're after, increase the time, let it go longer, and agitate it. Bounce the bag up and down, um, squeeze out the bag at the end. I know somebody's wincing in the audience already, um, but you can also agitate the tea basket. If you want a calming cup, the concentration of L-theanine increases substantially with time, although you have to let it go almost 40 minutes if you want the maximum L-theanine, at which point the tea is undrinkable, at least as far as I'm concerned, I did try that. Or choose something like Earl Grey. Pre-warm the pot or the mug um, to keep things at the appropriate temperature. Take the lid off. Tea has a wonderful scent and we you know, put tea in travel mug and take it off with us and it's great that it's not going to spill but if you can take the lid off and smell the beautiful um, ionones, the beautiful damascenones, um, the scents of flowers. Use loose leaves. Um, tea bags are great but use loose leaves and finally um, use a large infuser. The larger the infuser the more space those tea leaves have to come in contact with the water. Um, and what about that salt? I'm going to say that for me, the perfect cup of tea does not actually involve salt. It's my imperfect cups of tea that get a little salt. If I let it overbrew and I don't have time to make a new cup and I'm dashing off to teach, um, a tiny pinch of salt, like less than 75 milligrams, a really small amount of salt, not enough to taste, can relieve some of the bitterness um, and make the tea drinkable. So I'd like to thank um, the organizers of this. I'd also like to thank um, Bryn Mawr and the Vatican Observatory for all their support over the years, um, including the Frank B. Mallory Professorship. The NSF um, provided some funding for some work that I did earlier around um, uh, different um, stories for students around um, commonplace items. And I'd really like to thank um, the editors and colleagues who've really helped me um, refine my writing. So Stuart Cantrell and Gavin Armstrong from Nature Chemistry, who have encouraged me to kind of rummage around in chemistry's weird corners. Um, Laura Helmuth, who I took a short course from on science writing. Sabrina Vorvulius, who was an early editor. Um, Guy Consolmagno, um, who not only suggested the uh, method I used to measure those volumes, but also pointed me to some really um, wicked songs about poor tea in the U.S. and Helen Arms at the Royal Society of Chemistry Books. Um, without her encouragement, this book would never have happened. And I'd like to thank all of you for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was absolutely fascinating. I've I've honestly learned a lot more about tea um, than I ever thought I could know. That was amazing. And I just want to point out we've had we've had so many questions coming in. I think this has probably been um, the webinar with the most questions by a long way. And it's hundreds and hundreds of them. So um, I'm just going to say to the audience, if I don't get to your question today, um, I'm really sorry because we will probably run out of time. We have quite a bit of time left still, so we will get through as many as we can. Um, but obviously, I'm going to recommend going to buy Michelle's book because you may very well find the answer to your question there. We'll share um, the the discount code again. It's Chemist T30. We'll put that up on screen again as well at the end of the webinar you can get 30 percent off her book if you still have questions after that um, then her email address will be on screen um, please try and read the book first though because you know i think michelle would be inundated with questions and you very you know you may find the answer in her book anyway so i'm going to begin with a little comment from george who says i tried adding a pinch of salt as you advise and actually their black tea is not bitter anymore so they say it's a wonderful finding and thank you for that so so that's good to know um, I'm very intrigued by that. I haven't actually tried it myself yet, so I will do that soon. Um, I'm going to start with a bit about caffeine first. People are interested in decaffeinating tea and, and, and the process ah. of that. Um, but the first question is how much variation is there in the amount of caffeine in, in a cup of tea? You've talked talk about black tea, but how much are we talking about the variations in reality between the different teas? 
So there's a real range um, in teas. I mean, tea is a natural product, and depending on how the tea is grown and processed, you can have different amounts of caffeine. But for black tea and commercial black tea, it ranges about 180 milligrams per liter to about 300 milligrams per liter. So by almost a factor of two, green tea tends to have less caffeine in it um, when it's brewed, partly because you're doing it at a lower temperature and then you get less caffeine. Um, so that can range from like 40 to 200 milligrams per liter. Okay, so moving on to, can every tea be, de be decaffeinated? And that's from Lisa. Um, and, and then I'll also just go on to the next question, which is from Rory, about do you have any comments about the decaffeination process? Because they say that Clipper tea in the UK is quite a popular tea here. They promote their carbon dioxide process as safer and better for the taste and then the older solvent methods for decaffeinating tea. I don't know if you've got any comments on that. Um, and can it be done to every type of tea? Right, so I'll, I'll, I'll take both of those. There's a lot more in the book about the decaffeination process commercially, so I would point people to the book. But the quick answer is you can decaffeinate any tea um, by, for if you've got a tea bag, 30 seconds in hot water, discard the water and put the tea bag back in. The cup will be less bitter because you've taken out the caffeine, um, but you'll reduce the caffeine significantly. You can do the same thing with loose tea, you just need to let it go a little bit longer and then essentially reuse the leaves. Um, They've shown that if you reuse a tea bag a couple of times, there's really nothing left in terms of the antioxidants after two uses. Um, so there's not, not much point at that point. The carbon dioxide method for decaffeinating tea really is the, becoming the industry standard. Um, the solvent methods leave behind um, a residual taste um, that many people find objectionable, I mean, me included. Um, any decaffeinated tea is going to taste less bitter and kind of pallid. Um, and so um, you will notice a difference in taste no matter what method they use. Um, people are also trying to develop naturally decaffeinated teas. Um, so either by selective breeding or if they can, by silencing the gene. They've managed to silence the gene in coffee, but not in tea. And that has answered Claire's question, because their question was, um, does the process of making tea decaffeinated impact the chemistry and therefore the taste? And it sounds like, yes, it does. And actually, I remember drinking decaf tea quite a few years ago, and I absolutely hated it. And more recently, I, I drink it, and it, it, I can't, I can tell there's a difference. It, you, if you gave me, as a, as a taste test, I'm pretty sure I'd be able to tell, but I don't dislike it now. I can drink it, and I think, oh, it's okay. It's not as bad, and it means I'm not going to be awake in the night when, you know, I've drunk a cup of caffeinated tea too late in the afternoon so that's good to know right there there's some things you can do in terms of your diet too so that if you um eat a lot of grapefruit you can increase the time the caffeine remains in the system and if you add uh, cabbage and broccoli and the brussels sprouts to your diet you can um clear caffeine more quickly but that's amazing um i did not know that about the broccoli um but yes thank you for that that's that's good to know for someone like me um i'm going to move on to questions about the growing environment of tea so um there's quite a few questions kind of coming in about does the growing environment have an effect on the tea does it affect the taste or or how you need to process it or the amount of chemicals it has in it or whether that be caffeine or whatever it might be so yeah, it's a natural product, and so pretty much anything you do as far as you grow it will change the taste and the aroma. Um, so Darjeeling tea will taste different, for example, from an Assam tea, so grown in two different places in India. Teas grown in uh, China or Japan will have different flavors. Um, you can control the amount of caffeine sometimes by controlling the amount of sunlight that it gets. Um, so things um, grown in the, in the shade sometimes have higher levels of caffeine in them. Um, the early picking, um, so there's a lot of caffeine in the early growth, um, and so those teas that are picked earlier will have, so harvested earlier, will have more caffeine in them often. Um, so you really can, again, tea masters, people who are growing tea and producing tea, are tweaking things all along the process to change the composition of the tea, and eventually it's taste and aroma. And I'm guessing that the early parts of the growth of the plant have got more caffeine to, to ward off the bugs. Is that, would that be right? Because they're kind of the young that's plant that, trying to grow up. Right, that's the assumption. And when those leaves fall off and then you've sort of got this kind of um, automatic herbicide that it's producing around itself um, also helps continue um, to protect the plant as it grows. 
Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Okay, um, so Sarah, it's Farah is asking, um, can they grow their own tea? They've got two camellia plants in the garden and they live in the east of England. Um, how likely is it that they can make uh, tea from their plants? Um, you need a lot of rain. Um, that's so probably that's, fine. <laughs> that's probably fine. That's probably fine. We're um, fine for that. Yeah. And generally, I think you need warmer climates for that. Um, and people have successfully grown tea in a number of different climates around the world. So that's one of the interesting things is that tea is spread from some space in um, China and India to really be grown in Africa, to be grown in South America, um, to be grown um, in other places in Asia. Um, no one's ever identified the wild tea plant. so. That's interesting, but I wish I wish you good luck. I've never tried. I've never tried to grow it. I've um, I just end up, you know, figuring that I can get it um, almost anywhere in the world. You can get a good cup of tea. Yeah, I'm going to be interested, Farah. I'd like you to report back if you think you, uh, you know, have been able to make some nice tea. Um, we'd like to know. I think that would be really interesting. I've never yeah. actually tried to grow camellia, but I, yeah, I think it should grow quite well um, where I live as well, so that we could see. But we don't maybe get enough enough sunlight um, or, or heat, so maybe yeah, we'll we'll give it a test. Um, and then one question here um, is, are the minerals consistent in tea or does this vary wildly depending on where the tea is grown? I think we probably already know from what you've said already, but yeah, that's quite a good question. Right, yeah, no, it really depends on what's in the soil. Um, so you get uptake from the soil and so the amounts of particularly things like iron and cadmium, um, some of those other metals are really controlled tightly by what's in the soil. Right. Okay, that, that does make a lot of sense. Okay, we're going to move on to a few questions about what's your favourite kind of tea. I think you said black tea earlier and you're not such a fan of Earl Grey, um, but what was the best cup of tea you've ever had? And that's from Jude. So one of the best cups of tea I've ever had is um, Celestial Tribute, which is a pu'er tea um, that I tried with my students and that was just stunningly fabulous. Um, a good cup of tea would be, um, for me, something that's um, dark and black and a little bit bitter. Um, green snail tea is another wonderful one that I love. A little what bit is sweet. That? It's no snails involved, um, but it's a, <laughs> it's a green tea that's rolled up to look like tiny little snail sh shells, um, and it's a little sweet and a little grassy, and um, and a lovely drink in the afternoon. That is good advice. I'm going to look for some of that. That sounds quite quirky as well. I like that. Um, Victor actually asked about um, pu'er tea. Uh, so it, it, it's difficult to buy apparently elsewhere. I'd never actually heard of it before today. Um, but they said there's plenty of it in Asia. Why Why is it not very popular elsewhere? Do we know um, why we're not drinking it in you know, Britain particularly? I think would I'd, I've never heard of it. So. I mean, it, it produces a black tea. So it's again, it's, it's oxidized and it's done by this mold. Um, it can be very difficult to produce in some ways. So some of that tea is aged for 10 years. So I think that um, that may be part of it, why it doesn't find its way into, into Britain. Um, I can find it at specialty tea shops in the US, um, but it's definitely one that not very many people drink, but I would encourage people to try it if you can find it. Um, it's to my mind, a little bit smoother than a regular black tea. Um, and it has a slightly different um, molecular composition, um, but it's a little, not so much sweet, but um, the astringency is kind of smoothed out a bit, but you don't lose the caffeine. Okay, I'm definitely, that's another thing I want to try then. Um, thank you for that recommendation. Uh, would we have milk to it? I'm just, I'm wondering, should you have it without? I don't, I don't, I don't put milk in it, and I think the tradition would be not to put milk in it. Yeah, I, that's what yeah. I'm guessing. Okay. Right, and you can make it in a special pot um, where you just use the same pot for the pu'er tea over and over again, and the oils from the tea soak into the unglazed pot. Um, and so it's a really kind of complex chemical um, extraction as well as the chemistry that goes into making the tea itself. Brilliant. Okay, so we've got a question about tannins in tea, um, and it's actually a really interesting question because we we mostly talk about tannins in tea, and we talk about them in wine quite a lot. I don't know if you know much about this, if there's a difference between the tannins that we have in those two drinks. Yeah, they are slightly different. Um, they're all these polyphenols, so they have similar behaviors. 
um, but you have a different kind of set in T, uh, more of these epigallocatechins than you have, for example, in red wine. Um, but they're providing that same kind of, you know, astringency um, and kind of a mouthfeel that goes with tea and with, with wine. Um, so they're, you know, sort of doing the same molecular function, um, but diff different assortments. Uh, right, we've got questions about kind of the health benefits of tea. So um, uh, someone said it's usually considered to be a healthy drink, tea. We don't think, you know, we're never said, oh, you've got to cut down on your tea like we do with wine and, you know, only three cups a day or something. You know, so some people might be told that, I don't know. But um, we generally think it's quite a healthy thing to drink. Um, and But then someone's actually asked a question as well about, if I haven't lost it, um, how about pesticides in tea? Is there a difference actually compared to the organic teas? Is it worth us spending that little bit more and getting some organic tea or tea bags? Oh, that's a good question. I'm going to guess that probably, although again, you know, what you're extracting from the tea is natural herbicides and pesticides. So um, it's, you know, not totally clear that there's a huge difference between an organic tea and a an, uh, tea that's been produced with more herbicides and pesticides. But I think generally, you know, you would like less added stuff um, when you're, you know, for any kind of food that you're um, picking or using. Um, the other question about the health benefits, is there a lot of health benefits for tea um, that have been ascribed to it? And I talk a little bit about it in the book, but that's like its own huge literature. But what I was interested to discover were the health risks. Um, so for example, um, the catechins very effectively sequester iron in the bloodstream um, so that if you're anemic, um, you can compound that if you're drinking tea. So um, it turns out that tea is not a great drink if iron um, depletion is an issue. And that's an issue for an enormous number of women around the world. Um, so I was kind of surprised to discover that. Um, also, um, that there's a risk of drinking hot things, a risk of esophageal cancer that goes up with it. Um, and, you know, some of the catechins um, are thought to be liver toxic. So there's, you know, a number of risks associated with it, but overall, I think the um, people find that the benefits outweigh the risk in terms of health. Yes, I think that's probably true. And I, I yeah, I'll note those things that you've mentioned. Um, I didn't know about the, the iron, that's interesting. Um, so George asks, can I consider tea as the most widely used supplement in the world? That's, that's a really good question. Yeah, right. I mean, it absolutely is. After water, it's the most um, drunk thing. I think it's 5 billion cups a day of tea are drunk compared to maybe 2 billion of coffee. Um, so really, it is um, probably the most widely used psychoactive substance is caffeine, um, even more widely used than alcohol. Yes. OK, we've got a question about OK, we've not got that long left, so I'm going to try and get through just a couple more things. Um, what's the most persistent molecule in white tea and what molecule gives it its color? Do we know this? It's lacking color, actually, as opposed to having color. So it's less oxidized. And so you get less of those um, theorubigans, which give tea its kind of um, reddish color. It has fewer of the things that have been oxidized um, in terms of like beta carotene. Um, and that's done because instead of bruising it and deliberately encouraging that oxidation, you're very careful to keep it from oxidizing. Heat it up quickly so that um, you don't have the oxidation that's gonna turn the green leaves brown. Um, or in this case, they'll, they'll stay that pale, that pale white. I actually don't know what compound, what the difference is in terms of the molecular makeup so much. Um, I've got a question about uh, the type of water we use. So different parts of the world have hard or soft water. Um, I know this makes a huge difference to the taste of the tea because I lived, I've lived in different places with very different water profiles um, and I know it makes a big difference. And I've seen tea in the supermarket that is, you know, marketed for specifically hard water areas. Um, and how much truth is there in that? You know, obviously I, I can tell the difference, but I, am I just tasting the difference in the water itself or does that maybe affect the way that the tea steeps and... So what it does is it um, produces these kind of compounds that then um, sequester those polyphenols. So you've got all those hydroxide groups and those will interact with ions in the water. And so I can tell the difference between the water at the college and the water at home. Um, the color of my tea is darker, the taste is different. Um, 
and I'm not sure, I did not encounter the teas that were specially made for hard water. Um, I'm guessing that they're ones that have fewer ions in them. Um, so some of the magnesium that you get that develops those kind of um, chelates in the tea comes from the tea leaves itself. So I would guess that those tea leaves are probably lower in magnesium, but do not actually know. That's interesting. Yeah, I've definitely seen it in certain hard area, uh, hard water areas of, of the UK. If you go into the supermarket, you definitely see teas that are for hard water. Um, oh. And I, I don't think I've ever bought them specifically. And I have lived in really hard water areas, but I kind of just was used to it. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe that's worth a little little trial as well. Um, we definitely yeah, well, have to I, hard water in the you know, UK. Whole list of things. I, whole list of things I wished I tried but didn't try. And I'll add that one to the to the list. I haven't seen it in the US, so I may have to. Um, ask my my kid who lives in London to send me some. There we go. <laughs> That's a good idea. Okay, I'm afraid um, we ha we are running out of time now. Um, but we're going to put up um, the link again on screen um, so that you can get a copy, uh, get a discount um, on the R the RSC site. So we've got the code Chemist T30 for the 30 percent off the print or digital book. Please go there and order the book. Um, you'll obviously there's a lot more in there that we've been able to cover um, in this hour. The uh, offer runs from today until the end of February, so do make an order really soon if you if you want to get that discount um, and obviously share it with friends. Um, it will go out in the follow-up emails for all, everyone that registered who's here today, so you'll, you'll have it saved there as well. Um, so that just leaves me to say a big thank you to our wonderful guest today, author of Steeped the Chemistry of Tea, Michelle Frankel. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This was great fun. Oh, it was absolutely fascinating and I've learned so much about my favourite drink. Um, and thank you to you, our audience, for getting involved in the polls and the conversation and asking so many fantastic questions. I'm really sorry if we didn't get to your question today. If you missed anything today or need to go back and check anything you heard, then a recording of the webinar will soon be emailed out to everyone who registered. And if you've enjoyed this webinar, then please do check out chemistryworld.com forward slash webinars for our future events. And while you're there, feel free to register for a Chemistry World account where you can sign Sign up to our very popular reaction newsletter that includes a weekly digest of big stories from across the world of chemistry. I look forward to seeing you again in a future Chemistry World webinar. Thank you.